So welcome to our podcast. We're going to have a deep dive into the world of cybersecurity and data protection. Uh, today, I'm I'm personally extremely honoured and privileged to have one of the industry's most respective leaders um, in cybersecurity, information security. Uh, please welcome our guest and Chief Information Security Officer at Metal and Boxed. Hey, everyone. Glad to be here. Cool. So I'll, I'll, I'll kick this off. Um, Thank you very much for, for coming. Really, really appreciate you giving us some time for this. I know you're a super, super busy man. Um, as you know, I've been out of the, the cyber world for a few years now. Um, I'm quite keen and uh, and our listeners are keen to understand a little bit around like what has been going on the last few years. What do you think is going to be going forward in the future? You know, what has really changed over the years for yourself that you've seen within the, within the market? And I guess a follow-up question from that is, you know, where do you see cybersecurity and the role of a CISO going in the coming years? Cool. Yeah, it's a pretty big question. Um, so I guess over the last few years, obviously, there's been a lot of a lot of the same. So everyone's still trying to deal with the same challenges in terms of, you know, shift left, vulnerability management, asset management, identity management, all of those things. So all the things that have always been a challenge are, are still a challenge. Um, I think in some ways, some of those challenges, especially around things like asset management and vulnerability management and things get easier if you're cloud native and things because you got a lot of data out the cloud service provider that you might struggle to get out of your own data centers um there's obviously been a continual move to the cloud you know we, we've been talking about it forever but it's still an ongoing thing a lot of businesses especially in regulated industries are still kind of dipping their toes into cloud but not necessarily all in with the kind of cloud and things um what else has been going on obviously ai everywhere the last especially the last year or so with the kind of regenerative ai being a thing um Automation, I think automation is getting big, getting more, much more, more traction. Um, I think that's a really important way to kind of force multiply your team uh, and get you know get rid of some of the kind of repeatable drudgeable tasks or drudge kind drudge tasks, whatever you want to call them. Um, culture is becoming much bigger, so people are much more realizing security is a, a people problem. I think no matter whatever whatever it is, it's not just security, right? We're not some special kind of case, but basically whatever it is you're doing, people are always. Um, your best allies and and your worst problem in in many ways, right? So, by having the right culture and getting people educated and aware and engaged, um, you make them your biggest allies. You make them understand why we need to do things securely. You make them understand the benefits and the reasons why we do certain things, and they get much more engaged in what you want to do. Um, same with your actual security team, right? If I've got an awesome team of people who are really engaged and excited and skilled, um, I will then naturally get the right processes and the right technology and whatever else out of, out of that because I've got the right people doing all those things with me, right? So, but if I haven't got the right team, I won't necessarily, no matter what tech I throw at it or what budget we throw at it, you won't necessarily get the right solution. So people are always the most critical part of, of this puzzle. Um, in terms of what's coming up, I think um, AI, I've already mentioned that, but it's, it's not going to go away, right? So um, people are still, I think at the moment, it's like a huge hype cycle. It's whatever, at the sort of peak of hype of it's going to change everything and the world's going to completely change and everything else. But there's not necessarily that many applications sort of publicly using it. There's some really interesting stuff out there. A lot of people say they're using AI, or using ML or kind of other things, right? It's just a bit of a buzzword, but I think it will become more and more accepted um, and people will work out how to use it safely. So a lot of the challenges with it are around accuracy of results, poisoning that, that you know, giving it weird inputs and, and prompts attacks and that kind of thing. So there's a whole new range of, of security and privacy and safety things we now need to learn and understand so that if we do use AI for anything that's kind of like impactful, especially to, to sort of customers and things, you have to start thinking about all of the things you do to make sure that it's not biased, you understand its workings, it can tell you why it's come to a certain outcome, all of those things. There's a whole, there's a whole kind of new skill set we need to then build and learn around doing that safely. Um, we'll continue to see more automation, uh, especially um, you know, while kind of the economies. You know, a bit strange and you know, budget challenges whatever else right the more we can automate and the more we can kind of make repeatable the more you can kind of grow your capability without having to say i need more money and more people constantly so i think yeah automation ai uh, culture will i hope continue to be a really important thing that we focus on um and again with the kind of culture piece and organizational culture the better we do at that the more you have engagement from product teams and other bits of the business who the more they understand the why of security and how we can help them do things safely and fastly, uh, safely and quickly, fastly is terrible, I'm advertising another company there, um, the more it benefits them and the more it benefits our company, the easier it is to kind of do that shifty left piece and get 
more secure product built right you'll never not need security at the front end because no matter how securely you build your thing it's going to interact with other stuff you're going to have people with access to data you're going to have mistakes you're going to have trade-offs all of those things no matter how well you do you're still going to need i think some security at the at the front end as well but you can massively reduce your risk by getting your organization engaged and doing things securely throughout that kind of design and build life cycle as well you've come from um <clears throat> well you've worked in quite a few different industries right so have you seen much change within the within those industries coming from you know food beverage tech through to through to banking at fintech effectively um obviously banking etc is a, a lot more regulated but uh, have you seen much change in the way that people process technology is kind of has a focus or has maybe a a higher relevance to the board in in the different industries you've worked in i mean obviously it's it's every company has a, a risk appetite of some sort right any company that says they don't have a risk appetite is, is lying because it's not just security risk right you go into a new market or you invest in a new product that could fail or whatever else right? so companies all do things with a risk lens on them um i think where you have stuff that has huge value and huge impact there is more of a focus on security um just because of the value of what you're protecting um but also it has its has its downsides in terms of the amount of regulation you have. Actually, I I fundamentally think slows people down. I think mm -hmm. a good security team in a less regulated industry with support from their organization will deliver a lot more security a lot more quickly than in regulated industries. I think I think regulators need to have a real think about the fact that you're actually slowing innovation, slowing security under the banner of creating better security, right? Um, but equally because it is regulated, you have all these mandatory things. That you need to do to meet the regulation so security is always front of mind both from a it's the right thing to do and like regulating and legally re legal requirements so i think yeah it but it should be down to what assets you're protecting right so you should have your organization should have a reasonably well articulated risk appetite and should understand the value of its assets and then have appropriate security controls processes tech whatever in place to protect those assets um and also understanding threat landscape as well so i think that's that's the thing that changes probably the most wow. you know, organizations especially kind of obviously startups do loads of new things but there's a lot of organizations that have been in banking or their pharmaceuticals or supermarkets or whatever for years and they'll continue to do that for years because that's their space right and that's what they're good at mm -hmm. um and the regulations gradually evolve but they don't change like this like this but things like again i'll keep it's a shame to keep mentioning it because it's a buzzword but things like game changing things like ml and ai or you know new um new attacks or new zero days whatever else new think new ways of doing things for criminals the threat landscape changes an awful lot and changes much more quickly than other things so i think it's not just about um what your organization needs to do now it's about kind of understanding what the threats are out there as well so you, ma you manage risk and you manage vulnerabilities and whatever else but you also need to have a really good eye on what the threats are to your, to your environment and, and who's interested in getting hold of your, your information um which I think also touches on supply chain stuff, right? So um, we, we, everyone spends a huge amount of time thinking about their suppliers and doing supply chain security and all that stuff, and, and which is which is always a challenge. But organizations should also be aware of what they're in the supply chain for. So if you're providing goods and services to other people, you potentially become a target if you being impacted could impact them. So if you're a key critical supplier to someone else, you might be fairly small, but you're a critical supplier to a large business or a business that may have you know people wanting to cause harm to it. They might think actually that large business has got a load of security in place, but here's look at their supply chain. What suppliers could we impact impact them? So be very cognizant of as you grow and as you have different customers, you could be attacked because of your customers or who you're supplying, not because you're of what you have directly yeah yeah that makes sense and it's you're saying from from both sides it's utilizing technology that's available the people available to um to really empower the business to make sure that they can kind of reduce the risk and you know do something about the threats that are coming in that it's never ever going to stop And so from our from our kind of side, we we're very focused around the um you know zero days, the external threats, the the attack surface. Um how how do you see that or have you seen that kind of evolve over the years? I uh, InfoSec, I think I saw some companies talking about AI as part of an LLM. Um I think I think a, a large company quite some time ago were talking about it. Do you see much of an impact in in the short term? Or what are your thoughts around 
that kind of part of the cybersecurity industry and 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 how that's maybe changed over the years and and where it may be going so you're talking kind of threat intel attack surface pen testing stuff yeah yeah so in the internal external threats yeah so i think from a obviously yeah, threat intel is really useful i think a lot of places you get threat intel and it's generic stuff which is yeah it's fine you know a bunch of iocs are useful to look for and things but it's yeah. threat intel needs to be much more targeted to have that real value we all know bad people just want to do bad things right but when they're talking about your company when is there an attack imminent on your company are people talking about you know if they found your company's emails or password on dark web that kind of stuff right so you want great intel that is some general stuff and here's a whole bunch of iocs to throw in your sim whatever else great good good news but you also want to kind of make sure if you're doing going down that road you get some tailored threat intel that's very much focused on your organization your keywords that you've given them so you know what are the latest secret projects that kind of stuff so you know if there's leaks of ip or whatever else getting out there um more generally i think yeah i think i'm it's not that i'm against pen testing but i think pen testing is very very misused so for me uh, a pen test is kind of a belt and braces let's have a quick look at your whatever you're about to go live or in production and kind of go have you done the sdlc right have we got any low hanging fruit because the reality is right no matter how good a pen tester is you have a few pen testers looking at your thing for five days ten days whatever it is right there's a limit to what they can do so they're only going to be really hitting a very small subset of what you can potentially do whereas right. an attacker might spend weeks months even years if it's if it's not value researching your organization understanding your tech stack looking for vulnerabilities and trying different things so i'm i think they have value but they should be seen much more of a it's a, a quick check to make sure we've not missed anything obvious as opposed to are we secure because we had a pen test the sdlc is garbage there's not enough protection in in in, in fraud but we had a pen test that didn't find anything in five days right it doesn't yeah. mean secure it just means it wasn't anything obvious yeah. um so i think so i am though a big fan of the continuous testing model uh -huh. um no idea if, if you guys do that or not but the kind of where you have especially if it's like crowdsource so it's not one person it's it's a, a group of people because that i think replicates only from kind of an external attack perspective not like a kind of a red team or social engineering but in terms of your external facing app or website or whatever your so apis whatever they are i as an individual or i as a criminal can spend time knocking on the door and trying different things and downloading the app and trying to get it to run on a on a dodgy on a jailbroken phone and trying to talk to your api and seeing if i can take a certificate out of one of your apps and talk to it with something else and whatever else i'm trying to do I, I can spend time doing all of that so by having a continuous testing model where you get people who via whatever method are incentivized to keep trying they get to know more and more about your system your app your service whatever and it's much more of a realistic oh i've spent you know three months looking at it oh they've done a new release what's changed let's see if i can need like that so that's much more i think a replica of an external hacker or cracker criminal whatever you want to call them uh -huh. um, than a kind of point in time pen test and it means you don't have to have that panic of oh back to go live we've done a pen test because you're just having it constantly tested right so yeah. i think there's huge benefits there's obviously a cost associated with that but for kind of key things uh, i think continuous testing is much better than pen testing um i think red teams are also very important uh from the point of view of they look at other things right so you'll give a red team company um your goal is to get prod data or to put through a dodgy transaction or whatever it happens to be right and they can do they obviously can't do certain things so it's still not fully realistic they can't kidnap people or blackmail people or you know those you know, those kind of things that criminals can do and yeah. yes and certainly yeah, they can't and they're not going to want to destroy anything so they're not going to be ransom wearing you and ddosing you and stuff right so there are rules of engagement that makes the red team not the same as a as an adversary but it does help you find oh then why is that person in marketing got access to prod because they just clicked on a link and suddenly they, they, they downloaded prod data from a, a a marketing laptop or something like that right so you can find the gaps that a pen test wouldn't find that are much more kind of realistic of how people are going to get in because no most people i don't know if most people there's different stats for everyone right everyone's got so who sells a product has got a stat that says their product fixes the most important issue right but there's a huge amount of that actually are social engineering or phishing smishing phone calls dumpster diving walking into the office all those things are not necessarily oh i've, I've sql injected you because people are maj majority of companies are on top of a lot of the OWASP things right yeah. but they're not necessarily on top of everyone having a perfectly patched laptop that only has access to the minimum amount of things that requires you to 2fa or yubikey or something or any kind of serious access for every single case for every single user in your company so they find those holes so i think red team is really important um, I'm a huge fan of the purple teaming concept as well, mm -hmm. um, where you know, for those who aren't familiar, purple teaming and blue teams are defenders, red teams with hackers, you blend the two, you get purple, right? So 
lots of companies go, oh, we have to do a red team in super secret and the security team doesn't know about it so we can test all the things, which does have some value. But you can actually do it if you do a red team that the security team does know about, yes, right, they know it's coming, but they'll still you still have evidence of did they detect it or not, right? So it's not like you can hide whether we detected stuff, but you're sitting with the testers effectively. And every time they do things, they're like, oh, we did this. Did you see it? Oh, no. Oh, this is how we can change it. So you can actually make real improvements to your security posture because every time that the red team has try a new thing or send a new phishing email or try and run run a certain thing on a, on a host or whatever they're doing, you can see did you detect it or not and you can find those gaps and, and the, the blue team get to learn so i think i think purple teaming is very underrated and underused it's obviously a bit costly in terms of time and effort but i think i, I think that's a huge huge thing to look at in terms of ai and llm i guess you see this kind of like this future where you've got the the, the criminal ai and the, the defense ai and who's who's got the best ai model defending right and it's you know it, it could get it, it could get down that route and obviously criminals are using them i think what's it called worm gpt or something there's already kind of a there's already kind of explicitly criminal versions of chat gpt and it's also again going back to that prompt injection kind of stuff you can often ask good in inverted commas llms questions in a certain way like i'm writing a book about this or those kind of things you probably have to be about yeah. now but yeah, you can ask research and actually in a certain way then it will still give you the naughty answer because it thinks it's for a book or for a research or whatever so you can often get around the things that try and stop them doing that um yeah and i think with all these things for a defender's point of view they can help with kind of contextualizing alerts and getting better at correlating between different disparate sources because they can apply it you can apply a bit more intelligence to those things so i think yeah we'll see a continued benefit to to both defense and attack from ai things i think um one of the most interesting ones that i've been kind of having a bit of a nose around is it, where it's going and kind of things we're not really talking about so everyone's talking about ai from you know the llms and chat gpts but if you look at some of the things like there's a really interesting um youtube about battlefield ai from uh, palantir um mm -hmm. but they're also yeah there's companies like that that are doing really interesting but potentially scary things with ai helping identify targets in battlefields and that kind of stuff which then gets you to the um yeah can i then fall that ai into this hospital looking like a missile site so it gets bombed or vice versa so you don't attack the missile site those kind of things so then attacking ai and falling ai becomes like a really serious business wow. um, so i think there's those things and there's the things they've done i think i can't vote with ai to detect cancer as well and just by ch changing some of the pixels in the picture it can detect that it is either um benign or not benign and those kind of things yeah. um so yes yeah, so there's a really outside of kind of the, the traditional security stuff i think there's a huge i've gone a bit off a tangent but but i think with the ai and attacking and defending piece there's a very big thing around what ai should and shouldn't be doing and also when it's doing things that are life and death you know if ai gives me a crappy code snippet in git or sends me to the wrong help thing in a on a website and i have to do a bit more kind of clicking around to find the right answer not the end of the world if it misdiagnoses a cancer or misidentifies a hospital as a missile site or something else end of the world for some people right so so i think where it's the sort of more serious end of ai um gets you into really really interesting space around how you detect it and make sure it's always well i can't say always but as accurate as possible yeah i think there's with any new technologies coming on any changes there's, there's always the one pet that people focus on that's actually where where else can that go and what can that impact and yeah it's it, it it's a very interesting area of, of where it's going and, and how we can utilize it. I'm just going to jump back to your point around. I think a lot of when you were talking about the attack vectors, it's very much around the collaboration. So you mentioned the the red, the blue, et cetera, um, and actually working with customers. So there's a term that, that we use here uh, called pen testing as a service. <clears throat> and that's kind of goes into that area of like, how do you then collaborate with with your with your customer to make sure that you're reducing that threat exposure and kind of doing continuous work and i think that's the that's what i've maybe from my side of things uh, from the commercial side over the years seen a lot of a lot of focus on okay you come in you do this effectively audit this tick box it needs to be done as regulation based as you say we've made a change we need to make sure but actually the the longer term value working with um from both sides the partnership is we're going to deliver more value to you as a customer if we have more exposure we get to know you more we're collaborating um and you know we are both using technology to make it easier for us to um to reduce the risk to the business and obviously ultimately kind of help you achieve your goals and and, and again from the commercial side um, achieving our goals there 
it's really really interesting you go down that that collaborative route because all technology come out but it, it kind of like starts and ends with the human engagement yeah no, i totally agree i think you know i spoke about this recently on, on linkedin and stuff as well it's that partnership model i'd much rather have a very limited number of companies that i work with that are much more partners right because it goes both ways and it's they get to learn more about you whether it's pen testing or whatever right mm -hmm. the more they understand about your business the more they can come provide context contextual help rather than just general here's some advice or here's our tooling or whatever else um and you know selfishly from a um buyer's point of view or a customer's point of view less people to deal with is, is less you know, less people to deal with less less renewals and less whatever else but it's also you tend to get that better service as well um you know if you've worked with a company for a few years or you've got some you know people in there in, in there that are like you know more than just kind of client you know customer kind of client kind of people they're much more kind of you know almost friends in terms of you you'll you chat about things generally and catch up on you know email or whatever else when you need that thing that's like ah oh, damn it we've got to get this done by tomorrow can i can you quickly get me a, a statement of work together or help me out with this they're much more likely to because you've got that that relationship built up in the same way as when they're like hey would you mind having a quick call with a potential customer and, and you know, talking through what we've done with you or whatever else it kind of goes both ways so you both get a lot more out of it um and you know it's 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 easier to manage and i think i don't know what the stat is there's some crazy stat like 60 or 80 percent of all security tools aren't properly configured and stuff right so that going out and buying best of breed of everything from a whole bunch of different people might sound awesome if you've got like an infinite size security team to, to make sure they're all configured perfectly and on every endpoint and in every bit of the network they should be and whatever else but actually you're much better off getting things that are kind of broader spectrum and easier to manage and like it might be the 80 percent solution but it's configured properly that can be better than 100 percent solution that's not configured right so okay. so having that kind of slightly less you know, more simplified security estate um with some tooling that has kind of multiple capabilities uh, i think it's hugely beneficial or like it's already in use so um was it swan i always get them confused swan type or sonic cube sonic cube which is um as, as another example it's a tool devs use for like code quality and other stuff but it's got kind yes. of SAS, SAS kind of capabilities in it as well right so if they're already using that you'd be completely foolish to go oh well i've got a, a 20 a 10 percent better SaaS tool so you've got to use a whole new tool just use the tool they're using so think about what your environment is as well and kind of minimize that that complexity but also minimize the amount of tools that your your internal customers have to use because you're a security team so right you need 15 agents on every laptop devs here's your SaaS tool and your SCA tool and your das tool and this tool that you've got to run as part of the sdlc and it's all completely madness as opposed to oh here's one tool that does SaaS and SCA, and you can use it for some of your code quality stuff as well that you're already using. Awesome, right? Minimizes that complexity. So, so I think having having that kind of, it, there's so many benefits to minimizing how many different tools you've got and how many different businesses you have to work for with, um, that I think, yeah, the kind of the partnership model is is, is amazing. It's hard though, it's hard on both sides. It's hard for for vendors because you you want to sell stuff and I get that and you want to you know, chase people up to get leads and get sales. Um, while at the same time not pissing them off to find that balance and then for people on my side it's really hard because we haven't got any time so you spent time to build those relationships and yeah it, it takes longer than it should because it's like i can't talk to every vendor and i can't talk to anyone everyone who contacts me um and it may be even someone i think i use example it might be um even the right tool at the right time but you're just going to go with something you know because you're rushed right so uh, you know i gave an example i think if um you know i might walk into a new company and you know if they had nothing in place at all i might go right i'm going to get need to get an edr tool in asap just because of nothing on the endpoints at all but i need one that's going to do that 24 7 response and stuff triage for me because i've got no sec of people yet either right so um and i need it to be really quick and easy so it might be that someone from a, from a, uh, an edr vendor contacts me that day and says hey you're talking about this and it's like in a normal circumstance i'd like yeah i'm going to look at a few different vendors but because i'm in a circumstance where i've got i haven't built my team yet i've got some huge risk to deal with um i'll just go and i've in my last company i rolled out x and it worked really well and went across like thousands of endpoints caused me no problems i re i know their service back inside out i know how they deal with instance I'll probably just go with that one because I need to get something done and I can't risk putting in a new thing that then causes me more problems rolling out. So it is really hard. I recognize it's hard for, for people selling because even when you do have that fortuitous right time, right product, right email, I might be in a position where I'm like, I'd love to, but I can't risk something I don't know. Right. So, so you know, there is so many things that have to align to get that to get that right in place. So 
although we all moan about it i i do fully recognize that CISOs and security teams and businesses need vendors with solutions whatever they are whether that's people or process or tech solutions um but it's just it's hard when everyone's busy to find that balance of how how is it best to contact people and how is it best to kick things off because you know the the completely limited contact i want probably wouldn't get you enough sales if you did that to everyone but yeah so i haven't got the full answers but it is a it's a um a space that i think everyone recognizes everyone needs each other but mm. how do we do it without annoying each other and how do we do it in a way that builds those kind of relationships so you know you're both going to get good value from it yeah i'm, I'm hearing a lot of we're talking about collaboration but like a lot of community-led engagements nowadays like people being part of different groups or having existing relationships or you know not having to kind of go out and get those new things or actually if they do have something new it's then referenced in from somebody else which which kind of like de-risks it in a sense because i guess the hardest part within your job is you have you have a bunch of risks you need to work on a bunch of priorities and actually using the solutions that you already know and love and and know you know that work inside out but also being open and being able to have a visibility on the market of what's new and the innovative stuff that comes across um yeah massive challenge in time but i really appreciate your post as i as i as i commented the other day is it's nice to see that there's people like yourselves who who engage with the buyer engage with the sellers you know what's good what's not good just to then share that because it it can be uh it's not easy on both sides right so everyone's got a lot to do everyone's rushed everyone's getting you know making money to, to make ends meet etc um but actually having that very positive approach uh, you know a really nice of this is what you could do this is what you shouldn't do to help advise people because some people are getting into it they know and maybe they may be doing things wrong um so that's really really good you don't have to share that information and you're actually helping the the part of the industry which is and then kind of funding right like the business you work for there'll be people out there who are you know actively selling actually looking for new customers in xyz different ways and, and actually sharing that that positive message was was really lovely to see what i wanted to we've talked a, a good yeah. bit about um the kind of areas we, we wanted to cover today is there anything else you wanted maybe talk about before my my, my final question um no i was gonna add i realized that that for those who followed it that post i did about kind of do's and don'ts i totally forgot one thing on the do which is do your research so that's the other thing it's and it saves you time right because you won't be emailing people about stuff or chasing people about stuff that's irrelevant to them you know i've we the, the company i work for is entirely cloud native from from when it was born and i've had numerous emails uh or sales contacts about um you know digital transformation and cloud migrations and those kind of things so like come on we're pretty publicly cloud native um so do a little bit you know i know it takes more time but if you email me about stuff like that it's like you clearly haven't looked at what i'm doing mm -hmm. at all um and if you email me yeah you know, something that's you know totally relevant to what we're doing you've got a much better chance of of, of me re replying if i need that thing right um so yeah so just you don't waste your time emailing people about stuff that's irrelevant to them or very clearly irrelevant to them based on their tech stack or their industry or whatever else so yeah, yeah. That's, that's one thing i realized that after i put it up i'd run out of space to type in it but i was like damn it <laughs> I do your research as well so there was an extra one for exclusive for this recording yeah there's there's always one more isn't there yeah. there's one more there was a insurance company i was, I was working with quite an innovative one um they told me that they've ended up putting their the tech, tech stack online so you can kind of see what sort of things they're using and see how you could then fit into that environment and then help that research um you know coming from setting kpis and, and building sales teams there's that delicate balance between you know hitting the number but then actually being targeted and having the right research and i, I totally agree you need to go in the more information you have the, the more you know the better chance you'll have of actually having a conversation that's beneficial for both sides rather than throwing you know mud against the wall and hoping something sticks yeah so thank you for the the advice that you've given from the to, to the sales and commercial side of the industry out there what my last question i'd love to hear your thoughts on or actually your comments around so let me start one again <coughs> thank you very much for telling us around sorry just take a moment mate <laughs> sorry got carried away I just got yeah the other ones are fine I just got nervous with this one myself but anyway that will we'll cut that bit out so thank you very much for sharing the advice that, you know for the sales side the commercial side 
Uh, I'm quite keen to, and our listeners will be quite keen to hear, you know, you've had a pretty amazing journey. Um, what advice would you give to the younger you or the up and coming CISOs of the world for the for the next steps and, you know, as they aspire to be in a similar position? Oh yeah, I guess a few things. Um, one's that being a CISO isn't a be on end all. So don't feel just because it's like the chief security dude person, sorry, um, that you should aspire to that, right? If you love technical stuff or you love being in the weeds of security operations and dealing with instance and, and you know, that kind of sort of slightly more seat your pants into the world, whatever else, you can be really senior in security, heading up a massive security operations team or leading a pen test of operations or leading red teams or whatever else, um, or even you know, leading, you know, I always have a, a, a culture lead if I can, if I can get it approved in my team as well. So you can lead really big chunks of really important bits of security without being a CISO. So don't, don't kind of think that's where you should aim if it's not where you want to be. I know there's quite a few engineers in, in that I've worked with before that want to become really awesome what they do and like principal or distinguished or whatever engineers and, and, you can do really well financially and have huge impact you know depending what your motivation is doing that right so so i guess my first thing is it's not the be all end all if you become a CISO, you will not be hands-on um any company that's advertising for a hands-on CISO doesn't want a CISO; they want a senior engineer or something but they need the title for investment or whatever else right so CISO is not a hands-on role doesn't mean it can't be technical uh, but doesn't mean it has to be technical either and that's i guess the, the other part is um there's many routes here right so if you do want to be senior in security whatever that is there's a million routes to do that um especially in the less technical so if you're in a more of a grc or cso or culture lead or whatever else you need to understand people and business and other things like that and a bit about budgeting and um strategy and all those things there's a whole bunch of things that you need that aren't security specific right um yeah and there's you know i know for me probably you know, I love CISOing, but I might move to CIOing or CTOing at some point because that has security and other stuff. Um, yeah. Often does anyway. Um, so yes, yeah, so there's no one route you can get here from many, many different routes. Uh, if you're not in security now, think about what you want to do. Uh, obviously, if you're doing a career change, um, same as any career change, be realistic. If you're on 100k as something really awesome that has nothing to do with security, you might not earn 100k in your first security job or whatever. You know, so if you are really senior at something. You don't necessarily jump across to the same thing uh especially if you want to kind of move from a non-technical to a technical role or something um if you're more junior i can't recommend secops highly enough i think doing if you're especially if you're not 100 sure like if you're a super hardcore dev and you want to come and work in app sec or whatever else awesome but if you want to be if you if you like security or you find security really interesting and security research interesting whatever else um security operations is a great place to start because you will see a bit of everything right you'll see a bit of all of your organization you'll learn about threats you'll learn about attacks you'll learn about instant response you will learn a little bit about application stuff because if you've got a decent appsec function they'll be talking to you about what's coming and app changes and especially if there's something going live with any risks you're aware of what the risks, risks are and whatever else in live you'll learn a bit about infrastructure security because you have to understand endpoint protection and data protection and all those things so if you if you're kind of newish to security or you're not sure what you're going to do do a stint in security operations or something similar because you'll see a bit of everything and then you go oh, i really like this application web applications attacking things and, and what's going on there i'll go and learn a bit more about appsec or i love data and understanding what data we've got where so i'll go and do some more data security research and learning so it'll give you that opportunity to move into multiple other roles um and if you are not in the security thing and you want to move into it think about what you could offer right so again um it was quite a while ago now but i had a question once around someone asked you know how would they get in security and i asked them what they did and they were in i can't remember it was in it was in marketing or design or something so something where they'd be great at doing design work and other things so i said well come to me and talk to me about how you will help me have the best presentations the board's ever seen right um you know and, I, and how you'll help me kind of present security to engineers whatever else so if even when you've got a completely non-security skill set if you hate if you're great at design or you're super organized or you're brilliant at budgets there's going to be things you can bring that i may not have and my team might, not, might not have so think about what your skills are and what those skills could do to help a team sell what they're doing because security we've got to sell to the rest of the business or you know no one likes budgets but if you're brilliant at budgets or you're brilliant at planning you know a lot of security teams don't have enough size or resource to have like a project manager or a pro you know, program director or whatever in their team so if you're really organized and great at pro project management and want to learn security you go well do you need some hand a hand having your, your program fully captured in, in in a beautiful kind of 
you know, project plan and tracking tracking where we are against our deliverables and all those things, which is awesome for me because I have to send out regularly on where we are with our plan, right? So, you know, you don't have to have security skills to be able to bring an awful lot of things to the team. So just have a think about what you could bring, um, talk to people, network, uh, you know, sounds cliched, right? But go to a few events, get chatting to people about what they're doing, you know, talk to people about the fact that you want to get into the industry. Because if I've, if I've chatted to you a couple of times and I know you're really keen, uh, even if I haven't got a job, if I you know, a colleague or or you know someone I know in the industry is like, hey, I'm looking for someone to do this. I'm like, ah, oh, Jane spoke to me the other day. She was really keen on that sort of thing, and I could intro you. So, so yeah, I guess there's no one route. Think about what what your skills could do to help a team because security isn't all technology. It's yeah, you know, as we we touched on, people, process, budgeting, selling, project planning. There's a whole range of things that we have to do as part of a security team to to achieve our goals. Influencing people, culture and awareness and, and engagement, all those things. There's you know, psychology if you're if you're good at psychology you're going to understand people's mindsets both from an education point of view and how do attackers think or what drives attackers whatever else right so think about those different ways in network and go to some events um realize that CISOing isn't the be all and end all um it's one it's one job amongst a lot of different jobs you know you, there's the, you know in a bigger company there'll be people with lower and in inverted commas titles than me that probably earn more and have more people working for them uh because it's just a bigger organization right so yeah it, it's not about necessarily being a CSEC about what is your what do you what are you most passionate about because you're going to be doing this for 40 50 60 hours a week right so find the bits you're most keen on within security and smash those don't just go hey i want to do management and budgets because it's not you know I, lo I love my job don't get me wrong but it's not i'm nowhere near as hands-on as i used to be um and i guess the other thing is as you're building teams and growing up through your career understand your weaknesses so if you are from a super technical background maybe as you build a team make sure you've got some people who are really strong on like grc and risk and planning and things who can help you with with the with the other bits of other bits if you're from a non-technical background you might be really good at strategy and talking to the board but you don't really understand what's going on from a technical standpoint so make sure you have some really trusted people in the team to help you understand the technical aspects yeah amazing so very much around you know be be passionate, find something you love. And even if you're not in the industry, there will be something that you can really add value to that business and yeah, follow, follow that and see where it gets you. Yeah, no, I generally believe, and especially that passion, but you don't have to be passionate to be great at your job, but I would, I would really struggle turning up every day to do a job that I didn't like doing. Right. So, so find things that you enjoy doing. Yeah. Yeah. appreciate that. Thank you very much. No worries.